And so today I'm pleased to welcome acclaimed author and historian Frank D. Cotter, who is with us to discuss Mao's Great Famine, the history of China's most devastating catastrophe. Of Mao's Great Fam Famine, Kirkus Reviews write that, writes that it is a direct, hard-hitting study of China's great leap forward in light of newly opened archival material, horrifically eye-opening work of a dark period of Chinese history that desperately cries out for further examination. And from the Sunday Times, it is a work of brilliant scholarship that finally reveals the full extent of the horrors visited on the Chinese people by Mao during the Great Leap Forward. Meticulous. It is hard to exaggerate the achievement of this book in proving that Mao caused the famine. Frank D. Cotter is Chair Professor of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong and Professor of the Modern History of China at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Previous works include The Discourse of Race in Modern China and Narcotic Culture, A History of Drugs in China. We're absolutely thrilled to have him with us today, so will you please join me in welcoming Frank DeCotter. I happen to like bookshops very much. I spend a lot of time in them. And it strikes me that when you walk into a bookshop, whether it's in London, in Hong Kong, or here in Cambridge, um, there's an awful lot you can read on some of the great horrors of the 20th century. For instance, take the Holocaust. The wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book by Saul Friedlander is on sale over here. Not to mention other more recent books, for instance, by Christopher Browning, Escape from Nazi Slave Labor Camps. If you look at Solzhenitsyn, the classics on, on the Gulag, He's very much on sale here, as well as more recent work by, for instance, one of my favorite authors, uh, Simon Sebag Montefiore. But what about the Great Leap Forward? Is that not one of the great horrors of the 20th century? Well, I believe it is. I think that if you take Pol Pot and what he did in Cambodia, and you multiply that by about 20, now we get somewhere close to what happened in China between 1958 and 1962. Why is there so little in bookshops? Um, well, there's a very good reason for that. The regime that perpetrated these crimes against humanity is very much in power today. There's another reason for it. There's very little documentation available. Unlike the collapse of Nazi Germany, unlike the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, China is still very much in power today. The Communist Party of China is in power today. These archives are only very gradually opening up. So when 10 years ago a book came out on the topic by a journalist called Jasper Becker, um, it was actually poo-pooed by many people in the field because it didn't have adequate footnotes. Well, what I did is I spent about four years researching this book, and out of those four years there were six months spent in archives party archives that were opening up very gradually in the years running up to the Olympics. So for a very limited period of time, there was a window of opportunity for historians with a good letter of accreditation to get into these archives and start reading on these events that happened some, some 50, uh, 60 years ago. Um, I looked at literally hundreds of documents, hundreds of documents that range from ordinary letters written by people and addressed sometimes to the chairman Mao, sometimes to the head of state, sometimes to a local newspaper. It goes to extremely detailed reports about mass murder written up by teams that went into countryside at the very end of the famine, 1960, 1961. There are self-confessions self by leaders of provinces which presided over the deaths of millions of people, for instance in the case of Gansu province. Extremely rich material that has not been used hitherto in researching this topic. So let me get one thing out of the way right away. What, what are the numbers? How many people died during this event? One reads and hears about so rarely. Well, on the basis of an extraordinary range of material that comes, for instance, from investigations done by public security bureaus at the level of an entire province like Sichuan. Sichuan is twice the size of France. Here we, had, here we have the head of this bureau who uses everybody at his disposal in that province in 1962 to count how many people died unnecessarily. And he comes up with a number of 8 to 10 million people in that one province alone. 8 to 10 million people who died unnecessarily. Once you start seeing this material and you compile it, 
one cannot escape the conclusion that at least 45 million people died unnecessarily from 1958 to 1962. I still can't get my head around that number. It's an extraordinary number, num number of people. It must rank surely as one of the great three horrors of the 20th century, if not the greatest case of man-made disaster in all of human history. But it's not just the mere numbers. In fact, the title is quite this misleading. It says Mao's Great Famine. Famine brings to mind this notion of, of misguided policies in which gradually food disappears and people die, starve to death. Whereas what this one-party state reveals in its extremely detailed documentation, all one-party states, under Stalin, under Hitler, under Mao, keep extremely detailed records. Once you start reading it, what comes across very clearly is the extraordinary amount of violence that was exercised from 1958 to 1962. Violence, by that I mean people being beaten to death for having stolen a mere handful of grain. The case of Wang Tzu for instance, is reported to the top leadership. Here's a man for having stolen a potato he has his legs tied up with iron wire. Somebody dumps a 10 kilo stone on his back. One of his ears is chopped off, and finally he's branded with a sizzling tool. In one small village in Hunan province, Xiong De Chang, who is a local leader, forces a man to bury his own son alive. Here's a 12-year-old kid who has stolen a handful of grain. The father is obliged, forced to bury him alive. He dies of grief three weeks later. Across the country, from archive to archive, there are abundant examples of the use of extraordinary levels of violence to get people to do things that were, they weren't very keen on doing. People were drenched in urine. They were covered in excrement. They were buried alive, something that happened quite a lot in Hunan province. They were branded with tools, they had their noses chopped off, their ears locked off. Levels of violence that one can only explain by looking at what exactly happened during this period. Now, what Mao had in mind with this great leap forward is to create a, a giant army to transform every man and every woman into some sort of soldier in a giant army with brigades, with, with commanders, with small armies that could tackle one task after the other in a giant continuous revolution. And by doing that, he herded people in the countryside in giant collectives called people's communes. And before you know it, everything was collectivized. People had their land taken away from them. It was only distributed to them a few years earlier. The houses were taken away. The cattle vanished. The tools were collectivized. Very little remained. The food, most importantly, was distributed by the spoonful in collective canteens according to merit. So before you know it, every single incentive to actually work is being stripped away from ordinary villagers who know very well that even if they grow the grain, the grain will be procured by the state. Even if they work in the fields in the evening, they will get a mere greenish concoction out of a big pot of soup. So as every incentive is stripped away, the cadres on the ground, the party officials, on the other hand, have to ruthlessly whip up that workforce. They themselves are confronted to the possibility of being purged from the party. They must fulfill and overfulfill new sets of quotas, fingers, numbers, overfulfill the plan, produce more grain, more this, more that. And they themselves have to whip up that workforce. So as that carrot is taken away, as all these incentives are gradually stripped, nothing but a stick remains. In some parts of the countryside, carders, the party officials, and farmers are so brutalized uh, that the scope of coercion has to be constantly expanded, creating a mounting spiral of violence in which ever greater means of coercion have to be used by Carlos to get famished people back into the fields to do some kind of work. So this is one big thing about this period, the extraordinary extent of the violence exercised by party people against ordinary people. About six to eight percent of people didn't die of hunger, they died because they were buried alive. 
They were summarily executed. They were tortured to death. That makes about two to three million people who died violently during this period alone, 58 to 62. But much more effective than a cane to pummel or whip somebody is actually the use of food. And this is something else that comes across very clearly in all that meticulously detailed documentation of that period. The use of food as a weapon, rather than force somebody with a stick to go and work, it is much more effective for carders who preside over collective canteens, who have the food in their hands, to actually deliberately ban people from the canteen if they are seen to be too weak, too vulnerable, too old, too sick to contribute to the food supply. Don't forget, during this period, people are reduced to mere digits. There are nothing but numbers on a balance sheet. The state is everything. The individual is nothing. Just a resource to be used, exploited, in the name of a greater future and a greater good, like coal or like grain. It's very tempting for some of these carders on the ground to actually extrapolate from these rather macabre calculations and see people as mere livestock. After all, once you collectivize people, you put them into collective barracks, collective canteens, put the children into collective kindergartens, you actually have to feed them. You have to house them. You have to clothe them. And as there is increased starvation, as it starts spreading by 1950 already, and sets in by the winter of 58, 59, becomes very tempting to simply cut off those people who simply don't contribute enough to the food supply. In other words, there's a deliberate use of food as a weapon to starve people seen to be too weak to earn their keep. It goes back to a very simple principle which Lenin announced rather clearly. He who does not work shall not eat. And that is very much the principle that becomes a guiding rule during those years of masturbation. If you can't work, you won't eat. People are given work points, but those who can't make enough points are simply banned from the canteen. Those who speak out are banned from the canteen. Those who fall asleep in the fields are banned from the canteen. In some cases, entire villages are cut off from the canteen with extraordinarily high starvation rates. So this is the other discovery that comes through these, this massive documentation of the time, namely the fact that people didn't simply starve, they were starved. It's a great distinction here between starvation and deliberately starving groups of people to death. So far, I've spoken about human beings and the destruction of large quantities of them in the name of a better future. But collectivization did a lot more than, this, than just destroy human beings. If you look at famines, for instance, in Bengal or in Ireland well over a century ago, um, of course, people themselves start selling bricks from their own houses, might eat the thatch on the top of, of, of their hut might use a door frame for fuel. But what you see here is that radical collectivization destroys not just human beings, but just about everything inside that collectivized realm. Take, for instance, housing, not something that immediately springs to mind when we talk about famine, a very loose word used here in the title. Housing, up to 40% of housing vanishes in a province like Hunan, as reported by number two, a man called Liu Shaoqi, in a private letter addressed to number one called Mao Zedong. 40% of private housing has been destroyed. Why? For all sorts of reasons. First, for fertilizer. Initially, it seems like a good idea that you might take a mud hut in which, in which animals have been kept and in which some organic matter has been left behind and pulverize it and distribute it over the fields. But in the pursuit of ever higher quotas, the destruction of houses becomes part and parcel of collectivization in 1958. 
In other cases, houses are destroyed to build a better village. Here, after all, is communism beckoning ahead. Why be content with the backward village? Why not just destroy it and build up something much better? Of course, very little is built during those years. The destruction, on the, on the other hand, takes away houses of ordinary people. And what about these collective canteens, collective kindergartens, collective barracks? They too have to be built, and the bricks have to come from somewhere. But people contribute, but most of, most, in most cases, they're actually obliged to give away entire parts of their housing. Houses are destroyed as a form as, as, of punishment. Bit by bit, farmers start hiding the grain. A war takes place between those officials who represent the state and must procure grain at ever-increasing rates, and the farmers who try to hide it as best as they, they can in order to help themselves and their families to survive. Frequently, houses are destroyed. In, in the search for grain by the state, or as a simple measure of punishment. How about nature? Nature, too, sustains an attack that it has never seen previously. In some parts of the country, up to half of the forest disappears. Massive irrigation work, conserve, water conservancy measures, in which hundreds of millions of farmers throughout these four years have to work for weeks on end on gigantic projects building dams, digging canals, making a reservoir, a lot of it uh, is very poorly conceived and very poorly executed. So there are landslides, river siltation, soil alkalinization, all sorts of very negative effects on the natural environment. Here is a team led by Hu Yaobang, who you may have heard of, a great official who in 1961 spends three months traveling across the basin of the, the Yellow River and the Huai River. And he comes up with one conclusion when he is asked to explain why there are such devastating inundations right bang in the middle of the Great Leap Forward. This conclusion is very simple. With all these massive water conservancy measures, by digging ill-conceived canals and reservoirs, that whole natural water system has been destroyed. Transportation grinds to a, to a halt. It's an extremely wasteful system that wishes to pretty much move people and grain from one part of the country to the next. In the case of Hunan province, for instance, tons and tons of grain are being collected and are waiting by the side of the road yet there's nothing there to collect it. There's not enough fuel. Transportation system creaks to a halt. In one railway station, Zhengzhou, people dig a ditch that's six meters deep to dump machinery, cement, in some cases bags of food that nobody can collect. It's part of the collective system. It's part of that great command economy that sends goods from one part of the country to the other, but there's simply not the means available to execute it. Extraordinary waste at every single level. So far, I've talked about destruction, but I have about 10 minutes left, and I want to talk about something else. Uh, this is, after, a, after all, a book written very much about ordinary people, and not just ways of dying, but also ways of surviving. Many people died. But even more, somehow managed to get through this extraordinary catastrophe. And the archives there, again, give you extraordinarily detailed evidence of the kind of strategies that people used on an everyday basis to get through some of that horror. And the most common strategy is simply to try to not work at all, to conserve energy. So apathy at work, whether it's in the factory or in the countryside, apathy at work is not just the result of malnutrition. It's a strategy. People become masters of time theft. In the countryside, for instance, farmers will work under the watchful eye of a local official. But once the man's very often a man, once the man is gone, well, just drop the tools, sit by the field, and wait and rest. In some cases, where local village leaders somehow side with the farmers, very powerful uh, ways of 
of resisting the state developed and entire villages somehow sleep through the winter. But more than that, it's not so much time which is being stolen as actually the food itself. Theft is endemic, very much ruled by opportunity and need. Opportunities are the greatest in the city. Salespeople rummage in the back of the store. People in charge of granaries pilfer the grain. Shippers take it out from bags. People fake receipts in order to gain something. But most of all, need is what determines the countryside. And there, ordinary farmers try to steal throughout the entire cycle of production. And this starts even before the grain that is being grown in the countryside is green, before it even reaches maturity. People try, while they work in the fields, to somehow clip off a spike of grain and then crush these green kernels in their hands and eat it discreetly without any cooking at all. Cooking, in any event, would be very difficult. Pots and pans have been confiscated. Any fire would immediately point out where somebody is preparing food outside of the collective canteen, and that would be punished uh, by a ban on the canteen or some form of physical punishment. So people try to eat all of this raw. Then, once the grain is threshed, it's bulked up, sometimes by farmers on their own, sometimes by villagers that somehow bandy together and try to resist the state. Bulk it up with water so that less of, it, uh, less of it has to be delivered to the state. Once grain is on the move, it is exposed to uh, all sorts of thieving hands. People in charge of granaries steal it. Uh, shippers use bamboo tubes that they plug into grain sacks, suck out the grain and replace it by sand. At every level, people try to get by as best as they can. But in many cases, as starvation really sets in uh, and the, m the fabric of society starts unraveling, people have very little choice but to turn onto each other. They start stealing from neighbors. Sometimes inside the family, conflicts develop. In one case, reported just outside of the city of Nanjing, a man called Wang Cheng deliberately and systematically takes the grain away from his daughter, who is aged eight. In the middle of the winter, he also takes a cotton jacket and her trousers. The girl die, dies in the middle of the winter. In many cases where people turn on each other. And in the end, when nothing is left, they try to trade the only thing they have left, which are their children. For a handful of grain, they will give them away. Let me read briefly from page 284 to show what happens when no food is available but mud. When there is nothing left to eat, there is a white porcelain kind of mud that people resort to to fill their stomachs. I'll read from my info because my... My sight is very bad. This is what a team sent by the Provincial Party Committee discovers in one county in Sichuan province. It was a vision of hell, a serried ranks of ghostly villagers queued up in front of deep pits, their shriveled bodies pouring with sweat under the glare of the sun waiting for that turn to scramble down the hole and carve out a few handfuls of the porcelain white mud. Children, the ribs starting through the skin, fainted from exhaustion, their grimy bodies looking like mud sculptures shadowing the earth. Old women in ragged clothes burnt paper charms and bowed, hands folded, mumbling strange incantations. In one village alone, 214 families out of a total of 262 had eaten mud, several kilos per person. Some of the villagers filled their mouths with, with mud as they were digging in the pit, but most of them added water and kneaded the soil after mixing it with chaff, flowers and weeds, baking mud cakes that were filling even if they provided little sustenance. Once eaten, the soil acted like cement, drying out the stomach and absorbing all the moisture inside the intestinal tract. Defecation became impossible. In every village, several people died a painful death, their colons blocked up 
with soil. But not everybody waits. In some cases, farmers band together and actually attack granaries, torch government offices, or take over entire freight trains. This happens, just to give one example, in the province of Gansu. In one month, January 1961, in that remote province, up to 500 cases of attacks on trains appear. Farmers bandy together, wait for the train, and assault it. In one case, at the end of the month, up to 4,000 farmers take over an entire freight train, strip every removable portion of property. But most of the time, the violence is exercised against ordinary people and not by ordinary people. People in the countryside have to find ways of absorbing grief, of chukwu, as the Chinese say, taking anger and pain, living with loss on a devastating scale. How do we summarize this entire period? Well, I referred to the Holocaust in the beginning. There are many memoirs, and I'm, I have no doubt that in this bookshop you will find a book written by Primo Levi, who escaped from Auschwitz. And he described what had happened as Auschwitz, Auschwitz as a gray zone. He noticed that while he had been able to survive, everybody who had to live under the law of survival of the fittest had to somehow make a moral compromise, had to undergo routine degradations, for instance, by not sharing a handful of food that he might have discovered. So at every level, from the very top of the party, starting by with number one, Mao Zedong, all the way to ordinary farmers, at some point or another, most people had to make extremely difficult choices about death and survival. Uh, Primo Levi called this the gray zone, and I would call these four to five years the gray zone of China. Thank you. I was in London a month ago. Now, why is a very good reason. It, it's uh, both personality and system. If you look at the famine under Stalin in the Ukraine, or you look at the one right here with the Great Leap Forward, or later on on the Pol Pot, where many people died of famine, and of course, more recently, North Korea, it's very much the same system that creates very similar effects. And the why has to do, I believe, with radical collectivization. The belief that by holding everything together, one can somehow reach, achieve much greater results. But why at that particular point in time, why did Mao not look back at collectivization under Stalin, precisely at a time in 1958 when this was being denounced by the number one in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev? Well, first of all, here's a man who thinks that he can do it a lot better than that little fat man called Khrushchev, or even that man who is now dead called Joseph Stalin. Mao th believes that he's got the real way forward. He's discovered the bridge from socialism to communism. And that bridge is to liberate these hundreds of millions of people and pull them together into a massive continuous revolution. The people's communes, that is something that he sees as the answer to poverty, the answer out of misery, the way to really catapult China past its competitors. And then there is something else too, of course. Uh, by 1958, Mao has been pretty much in power for 10 years. And he's becoming impatient. And he's getting old. And he'd like to see some results. And he'd like, most of all, to show up the real leader of the socialist camp, namely Mr. Khrushchev. And this is why he pushes ahead against the advice of number three, Zhou Enlai, who he will publicly humiliate the base and the mind to make sure that number three, Zhou Enlai, falls in line. He purges the party, getting rid of hundreds of thousands of counters who are unwilling to go along with it. So it's one man's vision and a particular system that, that make a very, for a very bad combination, I would say. It, it starts with the purge at the very, very top. Already 1957, Mao starts purging people inside the party who, who oppose him. And it starts with the, the, the ritual debasement of number three, Zhou Enlai, who, who must be a top official. And of course, he does it in front of other leading party members who, who see this and have a very simple choice to make. And indeed, in the following months, in early 1958, several top leaders at the provincial level, 
are being purged, have to step down, are violently taken out by, by working teams sent by Mao Zedong. And then at a much lower level, hundreds of thousands of ordinary cadres are purged in 1958. By the time that you reach 1961, millions of them have been removed and are replaced by very hard, unscrupulous men who are quite willing to execute anything in order to benefit from these radical winds that are blowing from Beijing. So that, that's one explanation. And then the, the biggest, most extraordinary finding is that despite all of that, and when I say that people are being beaten to death, Carders too are being beaten to death for not following the line, for resisting, for refusing to inflict punishment on ordinary poor farmers. And they are being subjected to, to, to torture. So despite all of that, there are hundreds, thousands, God knows how many people willing to actually speak up. And this is the beauty of it. The beauty of the archives is that before we were able to read in these archives, we had the image of a very powerful general called Peng De Huai, who in the summer of 1959 speaks out against the Great Leap Forward. And this creates a backlash by Mao, who of course uh, gets rid of him and anybody associated with him. But now that we can go through these archives, we see that at every level there were people quite willing to stick out their necks and actually write a report about what was going on. We have people in, in the Public Security Bureau who insist on delivering what they think are the accurate figures for unnecessary deaths. Then they're, they're being told to modify it. And they refuse to do it and they end up in a labor camp. At every level, people, either through mistake or through sheer conviction, actually speak out and highlight one or several problems generated by radical collectivization. And of course, by the time that this country is no longer able to go anywhere, it is so surrounded by catastrophe that Mao Zedong himself has, has no other option but to step back at that point, a number of more powerful leaders start very subtly criticizing the entire enterprise. That happens in 1961, 1962. And you know what happens a few years later. Every single person who actually said something against number one is being taken out during the Cultural Revolution. So the Great Leap Forward is the key moment here where literally Tens of millions die unnecessarily. But a couple of years later, those who criticize it are being purged from the party. No, no. I, th I think there are several uh, explanations here. To start with, there is a law that says, theoretically, that after 30 years, a document ought to be open to the public. Now, of course, like all laws, this can be respected or not. It seems to me, uh, having followed these archives for the best part of my career, which is now 20 years, um, there has been an effort to open up more and more material. There is the example of the ex-Soviet Union with which the party is constantly being confronted. Look at what they did. They opened all their archives. But most of all, I think there was a moment of goodwill. There was a sense of opening up before the Olympics, the one, two years before the Olympics. And don't forget, they only opened up a part of the archives. It's partly declassified. God knows what is in, for instance, the central archives, which are still very much behind lock and key. God knows what we will find out once, once all of this will be open. So it's only a fraction of the archives that have opened up. And I think it's also fair to say that as a lot of this material was declassified, some places, some of these collections may have gone too far. They may have gone too far. Uh, in particular, when it comes to the Great Leap Forward, because the big obsession, the big political no-go no land, uh, the, 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 the forbidden zone, is of course the Cultural Revolution. It is as if the extraordinary obsession with the Cultural Revolution somehow allows what happened in the early years to, 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 to go under, under the radar. Abs to start with, when there's such a catastrophe on such a scale, one, one might imagine that the impact is immediate. But very often, for instance, in the case of Ireland, it, it took almost a century b before historians actually started writing about it. The Second World War 
saw some of the first real good writings about the Irish famine that had happened in the you know much early 1830s 40s I believe and so it does it does take a while um, the transatlantic transatlantic slave trade took a very long time before there was any serious research on that um, so it, I guess it does take time but there's one thing one I think in my mind I trace directly back to the Great Leap Forward and that is um, food the importance of food and beyond that not just eating and eating a lot a lot a lot but acquiring objects material goods houses that house we lost during the Great Leap Forward, let's have that brick house now. Let's have that food. An extraordinary, extraordinary level of importance given to material objects, as in Europe after the Second World War. People eat a lot to compensate for the memories of, of loss decades earlier. There are no doubt other effects, but I don't want to go that too much. It, it's a very common reaction, not just uh, in the case of the People's Republic of China, in the case of, say, Nazi Germany, where frequently one has to wait at least one generation. It's, 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 it's easier, apparently, for grandparents and mothers to talk to their grandchildren, to skip one generation. Um, um, but there is, um, th there is a part of this project uh, was, was interviews, and there is a whole database of interviews that were uh, taped and transcribed and will be deposited with the public library. And once you get to speak to people, not me, but local people, speak to other local people, there's an, a great willingness to talk nonetheless, to finally open up and, and have this story out there. Um, so what is the direction of People's Republic? There will be a translation in Chinese, which is being prepared right now by Bao Pu, the son of Bao Tong, uh, the, the person who published the memoirs of Zhao Ziyang. I can only say that for every one hate mail I get, I get about 12 emails on average um, from somebody in the mainland who has heard about the book and wishes to let me know that he or she is looking forward to, to seeing this in Chinese. So my feeling is that when you go through such a catastrophe and there is no monument, there's no Remembrance Day, there's no museum, there's no real public memory to talk of, uh, there's, there's a real willingness to, to read and understand about what, what happened. The time is about right. It's about 50, 60 years now. Yes. I think the example you, you just gave of, of your grandfather living in a village where there was grain in, in a public storage facility, but it wasn't opened up. And 10,000 people died, you say? I'm not surprised. That's precisely the difference between people starving to death and people being starved to death. Starving to death, there's no food available. Being starved, there is food, but it's not being distributed. And in some cases, it goes beyond mere politics and economics, as in this grain, we will not give it to you because we need to ship it to the Soviet Union. The grain rots as the example of the grain that was stored by the ton along, along roads in Hunan province, and there simply weren't the facilities available to transport it. So it rots. The food actually rots as people are obliged in some parts of the country to eat mud. It's an extraordinary level of, 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 of waste, chaos, and disorganization. Well, the Taiwanese knew very well. The Taiwanese knew very well, which makes me think that the Americans must have, must have known too. And the Brits sidestep the whole issue. I think that's that's the key to it. It's rather it's much easier to sidestep the whole issue and ignore it than it is to actually confront it openly. Yes. No. In fact, some of the people in the British Embassy at the time go out of their way to write reports about how rumors about famine are highly exaggerated and how this has very little to do with what happened under Stalin earlier on. So at, at that level, there is uh, some deliberate ignorance or sidestepping of the issue that is extraordinary.